Number 45. Two identical pucks collide on an air hockey table. One puck was originally at rest. Letter A. If the incoming puck has a speed of 6 meters per second and scatters to an angle of 30 degrees, what is the velocity, magnitude, and direction of the second puck? And you may use the result that theta 1 minus theta 2 is equal to 90 degrees for elastic uh, collisions of identical masses. And that's what we have here since they're identical pucks. They have identical masses. Uh, so here's a little picture before the collision over here. Right, uh, this puck will be moving with the uh, velocity to the right. It's going to hit the red puck, and then it's going to scatter, they told us, at an angle of 30 degrees. I'm going to detail that in a little bit. And uh, the red puck was initially stationary, and the uh, black puck uh, was incoming with a velocity of 6 meters per second. So what we need to do here is um, let's just first think about the general nature of the question. Right, We have a uh, collision occurring, and uh, we are kind of being led in the direction that it is an elastic collision, right? Uh, so what that means basically is that um, the conservation of momentum equation will look just like this, where we're going to have, so this is for letter A, that the momentum before the collision will equal the momentum, I keep wanting to write momentum as M, right? But obviously M is mass here. It will equal the momentum after, okay? So let's just think about what's going on. Um, so we have these items before they collide, right? So we have uh, the momentum, let's say, of the uh, the momentum of the uh, black puck before the collision, plus the momentum of the red puck before the collision, should then equal right the momentum of the black puck after the collision, plus then the momentum of the uh, red puck after the collision. So this is basically what we have so far. Right, and now what I'm going to do, okay, so we have this equation. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, a, uh, I want to just analyze what's going to happen after these two pucks collide. So let me draw now, so let's say that this is before, and what I'm going to do here will now be after. All right, after the collision. So what? Uh, in order to analyze this, I'm going to draw a coordinate system, okay? Now they tell us that the uh, black puck, which I'll draw in black here, uh, scatters at an angle of 30 degrees. Now they don't say relative to what, but I'll assume that it's relative to the horizontal direction in which it was traveling. And that being the case, it would have then a final momentum vector that will look like this, right? I'll call this P1A, right? So that represents this term over here in my formula. And we know it's at 30 degrees, okay? Now the next question is, well, where is the uh, final momentum vector for the red puck. Well, they gave us a little hint here, and we can use this formula to try to help us. Okay, this formula says that for elastic collisions, which we are assuming right now that this is, that theta 1 minus theta 2, right, will equal 90. Now, it depends on what you call theta 1 and theta 2, all right, because you'll get two different answers. So uh, let me just explain, uh, let me call this 30 degrees uh, theta 1. If I call that thirty uh, that theta 1 30 degrees, then when I do my math math here, right, I got to subtract the 30 on over to the right-hand side, and I would get a value of negative theta 2 is equal to 60, right? Distribute the negative on over, and we'll see that theta 2 is equal to negative 60. So this is, a, this is one answer. So where would that look in terms of my picture uh, down here at the bottom? Well, that would look something like this. Right, maybe I'll draw it a little, yeah, that's not bad. We'll draw it a little steeper, okay? So it will look something like this. Where's the arrow? There's the arrow. And uh, this vector now has a label of P2A, right? The momentum of the second object after the second puck, after the collision. And now this angle here is 60. How did I know it's down below the horizontal? Well, that's what the negative sign here tells me, that it's 60 degrees below the horizontal. Okay, well, what happens if you didn't choose to cho uh, plug in 30 for theta 1 and rather you plugged in 30 for theta 2? What would the math have worked out then? I think you can quickly do that and we'll find that the theta 1 then would have been equal to 120, right? And you're like, oh no, now I have two answers. Which one do I choose? So where would this, you know, angle be? Well, that angle would be actually over here, right? It's going to exactly be in the opposite direction, where this is the 120 degrees. But if you notice, 
you know, the angle relative to uh, P1A here is still 60, right? Because if this whole thing is 120 and this angle in here is 30, the remainder, excuse me, it's not, it's not 60 in there, it's 90, my goodness. It's still a 90 degree angle right between these two, okay? And this is also a 90 degree angle. Sorry about that. Um, so basically that's what's consistent, okay? So if this whole thing is 120 and this angle in here is 30, then this angle is relative uh, 90. Same exact case as uh, the case in red here, right? If this is 60 degrees below the horizontal and this is 30 degrees above, what's the distance between those two angles? It's 90 degrees. So it actually doesn't necessarily matter too much which one you use. We should get very similar answers, but it would make more sense if I, I had my velocity vectors uh, organized this way just because of the way I have this puck coming in, right? It could make sense that this puck coming in would ricochet this way possibly and then cause the red puck to go down, right? So anyway, this picture looks better. If the puck was coming from the bottom, you know, maybe then that would make a little more sense. Okay, anyway, let's not get sidetracked. Okay, so now we have this, right? Now, anytime uh, we have, you know, multiple vectors in a problem, remember we've developed this idea many problems ago in other chapters, I like to create something known as a component table. All right, try to organize our thoughts here. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna create a component table, all right, and I'm going to, uh, let's see what we know. I'm gonna have my X component and my Y components. And uh, let's first talk about the, uh, what I'm gonna detail here is I'm gonna detail all four of these vectors, okay? So the P1B, so the momentum of the uh, first puck in black before the collision, uh, that has pure X component to it, right? It's moving purely horizontally to the right. And therefore, uh, I'm just going to leave it here as a, well, actually, you know what, I'll, I'll plug it in. So it's going to be M1 V1B, right? Because remember, momentum is equal to MV. So I'm just basically, you know, breaking it apart, okay? Uh, so that should be fairly straightforward. Now, instead of writing M1, I'm actually going to write just M. Uh, the reason why is because they're identical, all right? And I want to... Uh, Really, M1, right, is equal to M2, so therefore I can just write them as M. And does the uh, does that P1B have any, you know, Y component to it? No, it's moving purely horizontally, so that's a big old zero there. Now, let's move on to uh, P2B. So P2B, right, it was initially motionless. So what's its X component? Zero. What's its Y component? Zero. Cool. All right. Let's just move this up a little bit. All right, great. Let's now move on to um, the momentums after. You know what? I'm going to just raise this up a little bit here. Just give myself a little more room. And let's extend that down. Okay, so now let's do P1 after. Okay, so now P1 after is this vector over here. Now, what would be the X component? Well, we are realizing that that's the X component, right, of, of this vector. And we realize that we know the angle, you know, adjacent. So I'm not going to go through all the... So Katoa stuff, you guys should know that by now. Um, so basically, right, to come up with my X component value here, it would be P1A multiplied by the cosine, right, of 30. Okay, great. And then what's the Y component of this? Well, the Y component would be this vector that I just drew, and that would be sine because we're talking about opposite, right? So that's P1A sine of 30. Okay, great. Let's move on to now uh, P2A. All right, so P2A, um, what is the, that's this uh, vector down here at the bottom. What's its X component? Well, this X component is pointing to the right and it's positive, okay? So therefore it's still going to be cosine. So it's P2A, P2A, a cosine of 60. All right, and now um, what's the Y component? Now just be careful, the Y component is pointing down, okay? So the Y component there is pointing down, and what that means is that the Y component here is negative. Okay, so negative P2A uh, sine, right, of 60. Okay, so now I have all the components listed. Now remember, just like when, we, when we've when we done problems in kinematics, 
done problems with forces, right? You have to be cons you have to be very careful about calculating certain values in certain you know frames, the x or the y frame. All right, I'm going to now talk about you know combining these vectors in the pure x frame, and then combining the uh, vectors here in the pure y frame, and then I'm going to look at it as a whole after I do that. So basically, here's my overall equation. But now what I'm going to realize is that I realize I have to be consistent. So I'm going to be talking about, let's say, my x components first. Okay, so I'm going to make my equation involving the uh, x components. Let me just put that in a slightly different color. All right, so actually what I'll do here is I'll do, so this is for my x component. So it's going to be P1, oops, P1B in the x direction plus P2B in the x direction is equal to P1A. Why do I keep doing that? P1A in the x direction plus P2A in the x direction. So all these values now I'm going to plug in. Okay. So here I, um, I'm, yeah, I realized, so I actually, you know what, instead of, the, which is totally fine, but I just want to be, um, what do you call it? I want to be consistent here. I'm just going to, this is true, but I'm going to break it down um, after I plug everything in. So let me just go back to here. I'm going to erase this. All right. It's right, but I just want to have all of the values in terms of momentums in the beginning. So this would just be simply P1B, all right? So it's just the momentum moving horizontally. It only has a horizontal component. Okay, so now let's look to plug in all the values. So P1B, right? So I got P1B, P1B, right? In the X direction, I can just leave it as P1B without the X, all right? Plus then P2, uh, P2B, well, P2B was zero, so that's plus zero. P1A in the X, which was P1A cosine 30. So that will now be equal to P1A cosine of 30, right? Plus uh, P2A cosine of 60, right? Because that is P2AX. So P2A cosine of 60. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to now expand on the momentums. Right? Remember, momentum is equal to a mass multiplied by uh, velocity. All right. Um, actually, you know what? Maybe what I'll, you know what? I'm not going to expand on them yet. I think it might be easier if I just leave it like this and then I'll do my substitutions and then maybe I'll look to expand. All right. Now let's do the same thing, but for my y components. All right. So let's write now y components. All right. Now remember the formula for the y components will be P1B in the y direction plus P2B in the y direction, right? Equals P1A in the y direction plus P2A in that y direction. So let's just plug in the values. What's, uh, what's P1B in the y? Well, zero. Okay, what's P2B in the y? Well, zero. Okay, what's P1A in the y? It's this thing, right? That's P1A, P1A, uh, sine of 30. And I don't want to run out of room. Let me just see if I can just scoot this on over a little bit. There we go. And plus, then the P2A and the Y, which was this. Okay, so this was, instead of writing a plus sign here, I'm going to change it to a negative. Minus, because it's negative over here. So minus uh, P, uh, oops, P2A sine of 60. Okay, now realizing I, you know, it's zero on this side, I'm just going to, make this term positive by adding it on over to the left. So basically I come up with this. I basically have P2, P2A sine of 60 is equal to P1A sine of 30. Okay, so now I'm gonna box this. So now let's take a step back. Okay, look at the two equations. What two things don't you know? Or what things do you know and what don't you know? Do you know the, do you think you can figure out the momentum before the collision of the first object over here? Well, we might not be able to find it exactly, right? Um, because we're, oh, you might say, well, we're missing the mass. That's a good point. We actually, we're going to realize that the masses will cancel here. So let's just assume we might know that. But really what we're after is we're after this, you know, momentum 
okay? I mean, remember, the, the question's asking for the velocity. So if I can find the momentums, then I can find the velocities. So notice that these two terms are what I don't know. And I have these two terms in both equations. So look, what do I have? I basically have a system of equations, right? Isn't that awesome? So now what I'm going to do is look to solve, let's say, this one. It doesn't matter which one we choose because we got to do, well, actually, it says, let's make this a little faster. It says, what is the velocity of the second puck? So let's solve this equation for the momentum of the first puck. Okay, so if we solve it for this variable, we'd have to divide out the sine of 30, right, from both sides, right, divide out the sine of 30. So we would get an equation that looks like this, P2A sine of 60 over sine of 30 will equal P1A, right? And now what I'm going to look to do is take this equation and plug it in. I'm going to take this now and plug it in for P1A in this equation, right into there, okay? So let's see if we can do that. And where am I going to put this? I think I'm going to have to do some erasing, okay, guys? And let me leave the table. I'm going to try to, just in case I might need it again, just for some reference, right? Let me, let me leave that. So um, again, I'm going to look to plug this now into P1A. Okay, so let's rewrite uh, that equation with that in it. So we got P1B, right, the momentum of the first object before, plus zero, but I'm not going to write the plus zero, right? P1A, which is now this whole term, okay? So let's plug that in. So now it's P2A, P2A sine of 60 over sine of 30, right? And now remember, P1A was multiplied by cosine of 30, so I cannot forget about this cosine of 30, all right? So let's multiply that by uh, cosine of 30, all right? And then plus, right, this whole term, P2A, P2A cosine of 60. All right, now realize we have common terms between these uh, two values, right? Between this value and that value. So I'm going to pull out a common uh, P2A there. So P1B will be equal to P2A. I'm going to clean this up a little bit. So it's going to be sine of 60, right? Multiplied sine of, that almost looks like G0, right? Sine of 60 multiplied by a cosine of 30 all over sine of 30 plus then, actually I can't close the brackets yet, plus cosine of 60, okay? If I'm looking to solve for this, I'm going to divide this whole term on out and divide the left side by that same term. All right, so just to save a little space, I'm just going to write it here. So P1B all over sinus, I'm going to need a little larger denominator, sine of 60 uh, times the cosine of 30, right, times the cosine of 30 there, little brackets divided by running out of space. Let me see if I can, you know what, let me just move this up a little bit. Sorry, guys. Okay, so we got P1B all over sine of 60 times the cosine of 30, all divided by sine of 30. Extend that a little bit plus then the cosine of 60. That is all equal to then P2A. Now, let's expand on these two terms, okay? Let's expand P1B. Remember, that's the momentum of the first object before the collision. So I can rewrite that. I'm going to erase it. And I can rewrite that as the mass of 1. But I'm not going to write mass of 1. I'm just going to write m because the, all the masses are the same. And that would be multiplied then by the, by the velocity of that first puck of puck number 1 times, uh, excuse me, the velocity of that first puck before the collision. And I'm also going to erase this, right? That was P2A. So that's equal to the mass. Um, multiply by the velocity of the second puck after the collision. Notice the m's are the same. So what does that mean? Well, mathematically, I can get rid of them. Right, so let's actually just erase them. And now here, lo and behold, this is now our formula. Okay, This now here is our beautiful little formula. So I'm going to box it. And now all I need to do is plug in the numbers. Okay. So the only number I have to plug in here is just the initial velocity, essentially, of B, which was 6. Okay, so I'm going to do that in the calculator. So I got V2A. Now let's plug that in. Okay, where's the calculator? Here it is. 
So now um, V1B was six. Divide that now by, actually, you know what? I'm gonna calculate the denominator first since there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. So let's do sine of 60 multiplied by cosine 30 and then divide that by sine of 30 plus then the cosine of 60. Numbers work out pretty nicely. And then it's V1B, which is six divided by two. So therefore we get a value of three, All right? So V2A is three meters per second. All right, now let's just quickly calculate V2A so we have it, all right? In, uh, it's, sorry, not V2A, V1A in case we need it. I'm gonna look to use, you know, this formula down here. So I'm gonna rework this a little bit just like I, just like I did for this uh, problem over here. Um, actually, what I'll do is I'll do that over here next. So I'm gonna expand on the P2A. Remember P2A is equal to then the mass multiplied by V2A which we just found, okay, times the sine of 60, all over then the uh, sine of 30, and that'll equal P1A. Now remember, the momentum is equal to the mass multiplied by V1A, okay? What happens to the M's here again? They go bye-bye, we can cancel them, so let's just erase them. And now we realize that here's our lovely equation, right? Our lovely equation here is now telling us that if I just know the velocity of the second one after the collision, which we do, we can plug it in because these terms we know. So let's just plug three in for here and calculate, all right? So basically it's three times the sine of 60, all right, divided by then sine of 30. And what do we get? 5.196, I'm gonna call it 5.20, okay? So we got V1A is gonna be 5.20 meters per second. Finally, right, we got those answers, although we only needed one of them for now um, to answer A, but I think for B we're gonna need a, because we gotta talk about kinetic energy. Um, so, and then they also want a direction, but we know the directions, all right, 30 and 60 over here respectively. So, uh, okay, so now let's take care of letter B. Letter B says confirm that the, elas uh, that the collision is elastic. Remember, elastic collisions uh, do have conservation of kinetic energy. Any elastic collisions do not. Therefore, I should expect the kinetic energy initially to equal the kinetic energy finally. And I'm going to write out on the upper right-hand corner here, I'll do it in black, I'm gonna write out what I just said, that the kinetic energy initially better equal the kinetic energy uh, finally, okay? So the initial kinetic energy would be one half multiplied by the mass multiplied by the velocity of the first item, right, before the collision, squared. The second item wasn't moving, so it has no kinetic energy. So that should then equal the final uh, kinetic energies in which both objects here finally are moving. So I gotta take them both into account. Uh, so one half multiplied by the mass, right? Times the velocity of the first object after the collision squared, uh, multiplied, uh, not multiplied, added to one half times the mass multiplied by the velocity of the second object after the collision squared. Uh, so now we can cancel some terms, right? The half is in common amongst everyone. And so the masses are the same, so they can cancel out too. And we realize we have this nice, beautiful equation of V1B uh, squared will equal V1A squared plus V2A squared. So let's plug in the numbers. V1B was six, right? That was the velocity of the puck before the collision. Velocity of the puck here after the collision for V1A was 5.2. Remember, we, we rounded this slightly. So it might be, oops, it was two zero. So it might be slightly off, but it should be really close, okay? And then V2A was three. So that's gonna be three squared, and this is 36. Let's confirm with the calculator. 5.2 squared plus three squared, and look at that, 36.04, which is basically 36, okay? The reason why it's a little off is because, um, you know, we rounded. So uh, basically the, elas the collision is elastic. We just proved the conservation of kinetic energy. Ladies and gentlemen, this was a journey, huh? This was one of those hard ones. Um, thank you very much for if you were able to stick to the end of this. I commend your determination. All right. I appreciate it very much as well. I know it's hard listening to myself for uh, 20 some odd minutes. I don't even know how long this is, but I, I got it. Uh, but in any case, I, I really do appreciate it very much. Um, please remember to hit that subscribe button if we're able to help you out at all. And that'd be a small way to help us out. We'd appreciate it very much. And um, I look forward to helping you with the next question. Have a great day.